Here we're going to look at a nice combinatorics problem, which we'll solve using complex arithmetic. In particular, we'll use the notion of the roots of unity. So let's see the setup. So let's suppose little m, little n, capital M, capital N are all natural numbers. And by that, I mean positive integers. And then suppose that we've got this capital M by capital N rectangle, and it can be tiled using a combination of these horizontal strips, which are M by one, and these vertical strips, which are one by M. And our goal is to show that in fact, we only need one type of these strips. So in other words, if it's possible to tile this rectangle using horizontal and vertical strips, then in fact, we could really only tile it using either horizontal strips only or vertical strips only. Okay, so let's see maybe how we could do this. And what we first wanna notice is that this will follow if we give some sort of divisibility relationship between these capital numbers and these lowercase numbers. So in other words, if we show one of these two properties, M divides capital M or N divides capital N. So let's maybe see why that's true. And we'll see why that's true just by looking at a little picture. So let's notice that if little m divides capital M, then that means that capital M equals little m times k, where k is some natural number. Okay, good. But now, let's take our capital M by capital N rectangle, and notice that this relationship right here tells us that we can fill one of these rows with k horizontal strips. So let's maybe write this down. So let's say here we've got one of the strips, and then next here we have another strip all the way up, and here we have our k strip. And it's exactly k strips. So we'll notice that each of these are little m in length, making the whole thing little m times k in length. Okay, good. And then, well, what's the other setup? The other setup would be little n divides capital N. But in that case, we really just have this picture on its side. So I'll let you guys draw that picture if you want to. But what we'll show from here on out is that either little m divides capital M or little n divides capital N. Okay, let's get rid of this and we'll start doing that. On the last board, we described why we in fact only need to show that little m divides capital M or little n divides capital N. Now we're gonna work towards that. And like I alluded to before, we're gonna use the notion of complex numbers, in fact, just roots of unity. So let's consider two sets of roots of unity. And the roots of unity I wanna look at are the little mth root of unity and the little nth root of unity. So let's say alpha, is equal to the mth root of unity. So in other words, it's e to the i 2 pi over m. And I should say that's a primitive mth root of unity. I'll let you guys check the careful definition of a primitive mth root of unity versus any mth root of unity if you want to, but this is one of them. Okay, so what we wanna notice here is that alpha to the m is equal to one, which means that alpha is a root of the polynomial z to the m minus one. In other words, it's a solution to z to the m minus one equals zero. And in fact, all solutions of z to the m minus one equals zero are powers of alpha. They're alpha to the zero, which is one, alpha to the one, alpha squared, all the way up to alpha to the m minus one. So that's like kind of a well-known result involving roots of unity. Okay, so now that we've got our little mth root of unity, we're probably gonna need our little nth root of unity as well. So let's say that's beta. So this is gonna be e to the i 2 pi over n, where that tells us that beta to the n is equal to one. In other words, beta is a root of z to the n minus one. In other words, the solution to z to the n minus one equals zero. And this is in fact a primitive nth root of unity. Okay, so next what we wanna do is fill in every unit square in this m by n rectangle 
with some number, which is a product of a power of alpha and a power of beta. So let's see how we can do that. So in the KL entry of our rectangle, we'll put the number which is alpha to the K, beta to the L. Okay, so let's maybe draw a picture of what I mean by that. Okay, so here's our filled in grid. So notice up here at the upper left, we've got the number alpha times beta. Down here we have alpha to the M times beta to the M. And here at a general spot, we've got alpha to the K times beta to the L. So notice that this is in the kth column and the lth row. So let's maybe put that right here. This is our k column and our l row. Okay, great. Now we want to look at two important cases. So these are not the only important cases, but notice we can choose this square alpha k beta to the l so that it's either at the leftmost end of one of these horizontal strips or at the topmost end of one of these vertical strips. So let's write that down as our cases. So case number one, alpha k beta to the L is at the left of our horizontal strip. So I'll just write it like that. And then case number two, which I'll write down here, is alpha k beta to the L is at the top of our vertical strip. So I'll write that like this. So next what we'll do is sum all of the entries in each of these strips. Okay, so let's start with this one. So that'll start with alpha to the K beta to the L. Now we're summing along a horizontal strip. So all of these beta terms are gonna be the same, but now our alpha term is gonna increase its exponent by one. So the next term will be alpha to the K plus one times beta to the L. And then we end with alpha to the K plus M minus one times beta to the L. And that's because we've got M total objects there because our horizontal strips are M by one. So next what we can do is go ahead and factor like a greatest common factor out of this, which is alpha to the K beta to the L. Notice we'll have that this is alpha to the K beta to the L and then one plus alpha plus all the way up to alpha to the M minus one. But what that tells us is that we get zero. And why do we get zero? Well, that's because this object right here can be rewritten using the sum of a finite geometric series in the following way. We've got alpha to the K beta to the L and then alpha to the M minus one over alpha minus one. Again, that's by the sum of a finite geometric series. You can also think about just like dividing those as they were polynomials. But notice alpha to the M equals one, which means alpha to the M minus one is equal to zero, which makes this thing right here zero. So next we can do essentially the same thing for our vertically oriented strip. We can add this, this will be alpha to the K times beta to the L plus alpha to the K times beta to the L plus one, all the way down to alpha to the K times beta to the L plus N minus one. And then doing essentially the same sort of calculation, we'll get that this is equal to alpha to the K beta to the L times beta to the N minus one over beta minus one, which is equal to zero. So now what we can do is think about summing over all of the squares in this entire rectangle. So if we sum over all of the squares in this entire rectangle, what we can do is break that into two separate sums. And those are sums over the horizontal strips and then sums over the vertical strips. So let's write that down. So sum over all squares. So like I said, that's gonna be sum over horizontal strips plus the sum over the vertical strips. But here we showed that the sums over the horizontal strips was zero. Here we showed that the sum over the vertical strips was zero, meaning this entire sum is zero plus zero, which is zero. Okay, so let's maybe clean some of this up and then we'll move on to finish this. Last board, we laid out our rectangle with these unit squares. 
We showed that sum over any horizontal strip was equal to zero. The sum over any vertical strip was equal to zero. But that means the sum over the horizontal plus the vertical strips is equal to zero. But that's the sum of all of the squares given the fact that we can tile this rectangle by horizontal and vertical strips. So we've got zero is equal to the sum over all squares in this rectangle. But now we can write that sum of all squares in this rectangle a different way as a double sum. So let's go ahead and do that. That's also equal to the sum as k goes from 1 to capital M, and then the sum as L goes from 1 to capital N of alpha to the k times beta to the L. Again, that's more of a straightforward calculation of the sum of all of the entries inside of this rectangle. Notice that this power of alpha depends on k but not L, and vice versa for the power of beta. So we can pull this apart into two sums being multiplied. So let's do that. This is gonna be equal to the sum as k goes from one to capital M of alpha to the k times the sum as L goes from one to capital N of beta to the L. But those are both finite geometric series. So since they're finite geometric series, we can use the formula for the sum of a finite geometric series to find closed forms for each of these. I'll let you guys look that up if you need to, but we get an alpha times beta out front because those are the starting terms for each of these. The starting term for this is alpha to the one. Starting term for the other one is alpha or is beta to the one. And then for this guy right here, we'll have alpha to the capital M minus one over alpha minus one. Then for this next one, we'll have beta to the capital N minus one over beta minus one. But now what that tells us is that this product of four objects equals zero, which means one of those has to be equal to zero. Alpha and beta are not zero because they're primitive nth roots of unity, but that tells us that alpha to the m minus one or beta to the n minus one is equal to zero. So let's write that down. So alpha to the m minus one equals zero. So that means alpha to the m equals one or beta to the n equals one. But that tells us that alpha to the capital M is a little nth root of unity and beta to the capital N is a little nth root of unity. In other words, we can write alpha to the capital M as alpha to the little m to the, let's say, r. Again, that's from the theory of roots of unity, but that tells us that m times r equals capital M. In other words, little m divides capital M, which was one of the things that we could get at. Or we have the same kind of thing over here. So beta to the n is equal to beta to the little n to the s, but that implies that little n divides capital N, which was the other thing we wanted to get at. So either way we go down this or statement, we get one of these statements that we wanted to prove, which means we're done. And that's a good place to stop.